going to be, you know, the, uh, just our, my thoughts as an individual um, and what the show that we have put together, it's, it's all a teamwork that several of my colleagues within HKS, they have helped us put together, uh, looking at where we are and what's happening. What you see here is a Reader's Digest cover page, 1966. That was their prediction for future of the world in 1999. In this art of world in 1999 and beyond, they envisioned, you know, this, this guy Fred Freeman envisioned that we'll have rocket belts, domes over cities to control the climate, hovering vehicles, flying boats, moving sidewalks everywhere, and saucer-shaped transports. That this is what 1999 was going to look like for, at, in, in 1966. This is where we are today doesn't look like anything what we have here or what we had envisioned here. A lot of things are changing. There, there are so many things happening. So just in April 2016, I was standing, you know, my, 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 and I'm going to get a little personal here. My father flew in from Canada and just in the middle of, the, you know, as soon as he arrived in a couple of hours, he, you know, he was uh, complained of some restlessness. We, you know, he was wheeled in into one of the most premium facilities in Delhi. And so, you know, everything went well and so on and so forth. So there was a very initial prognosis. So his actual diag or prognosis or the, or the, just the diagnostics portion, you know, took about 20 minutes, you know, came out clean. And when I went back to the hospital after, like in the evening, so I walked in, I, you know, walked into the room and there he was sitting on the recovery and, uh, and kind of a little fatigued. So I asked him, I said, how are you doing? So his response was, uh, I'm doing kind of okay. And so, you know, the reports are fine and I'm just waiting to and get back home. And uh, I thought that, but I thought we had that conversation at 10 a.m. in the morning. And here we are at 5 p.m. Uh, in the hospital. So have you had anything to eat yet? So I said, so how, how are you feeling? He said, well, the test reports and all that, everything came on okay, but I am missing, uh, I'm not, feeling like some, anybody's treating me like a person. He said, there are, there's staff coming in and out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting the vaccines. They're taking tests. I'm being willed and I'm carting, you know, left, right, and center. They're taking me to different departments and everything is okay. And now I'm just waiting for my bill. The staff, nobody's coming in and greeting me good morning or saying hello. And uh, they're, to they're talking to themselves. There are conversations between the staff happening to each other. but. I'm not feeling being, a, I, feel, I feel like being a piece of meat, being wheeled around. So here, and, and, and of course, so I stand by the window and I can envision I'm looking at the skyline. So here I'm, I'm standing in one of the, in a millennium city, looking at a beautiful picture. And, and I said, we have all the access in the world, um, you know, and, uh, and, and standing in a facility of repute. But here is a person, irrespective of how he was related to me, uh, who's not, who, who's missing feeling human. So, and, 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 and I'm, we, we, we have worked with pretty much, you know, in the past several years, the top five largest health systems in Asia, private sector, we have learned, we have, you know, visited several facilities in the, in the, in the public sector as well, in the, in the, in the government sector. But here, there, that, so these experiences bring you down to the basics. And then, you know, in, in 2017, right now, there are a lot of disruptions happening. You know, when was the last time when actually one of you stopped by the wayside and hailed a cab? You know, you wouldn't remember that, you know, you actually stood by the sidewalk and hailed a cab. I'm pretty confident that several of us at some point stood by, you know, and reflected that, okay, I wish I could own a hotel. So Uber, Airbnb, Oyo Rooms, they have been the game changers. Suddenly, we all are empowered. You know, the, the world's power is in our palms. You know, we have these cell phones, uh, the smartphones, they have, you know, I'm stating the obvious, they have been the game changers. So there are all these influences that are happening. They're affecting businesses. They're affecting, like, you know, they, they've changed the whole definition of, you know, in, in the healthcare context. I grew up in an environment where we had a family doctor. I was looking for that image where the family doctor would come home, would treat you know me as we were kids. Everybody in the family would go to him, and now, you know, I'm expected if I were to go to a if I'm not feeling well, I'm feeling terrible. I'm nervous about calling my 
hospital, a clinic. The biggest worry is I'll call him up and say, is the doctor available today? I'm crossing my fingers if he's available today or am I going to be given an appointment tonight, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. And then I'm expected to go to the clinic, spend there for, you know, spend and even see the doctor. He's going to spend about, you know, uh, I'll have to wait in queue, get the billing and all that and wait in queue. He'll make the actual and see the doctor for like, let's say, seven minutes, 10 minutes. He'll make a meaningful conversation. You know, the doctor and patient time is about not more than five minutes, seven minutes or something like that. And then I spend another, uh, you know, couple of, well, maybe half an hour or an hour in doing my billing and going home, which reminds me of the same experience that I had with my dad where the actual procedure took 20 minutes, but we waited five hours to pay the bill and go home. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. So on one end, there's a human level, which is the patient care. And on the other end, it just adds to the inefficiencies of the whole system. So what does profitability mean? You know, and, and then, you know, going uh, just beyond, you know, we have the M health, we have several disruptors happening. Now in healthcare, in context, you know, we, of course, Ubers and uh, in music, going back to the same thing, you know, Spotify has changed, you know, the way we ac have access to music. So there are all these disruptions and disruptors that are happening in the world. In healthcare context, not, net, not per, per se that we do not have those disruptors, we have those disruptors in the sense, in, in the form of technology coming, coming in. For example, you know, the healthcare disruptors are expected to make the system more efficient. I wish the payment systems or the appointment systems, well, of course, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar would know, you know, he, when we visited Ames, you know, he was the one who actually told us that, guys, visit Ames, how, how those disruptors have improvised the appointment system in Ames that gets like 10,000 footfalls in a day and how they've digitized. So the whole, those disruptors in medical field, which actually translate to the efficiency are happening in technology and we haven't gotten to the patient yet. Moving along, uh, you know, earlier, of course, the, the, the interface was very simple. You know, uh, it was the patient, the doctor, family doctor, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now the whole engagement is very different. Uh, we have the patient, of course, we have the nurses, we have the schedulers, we have a local clinic, and you know, of course, which is a part of the larger health system, and everything in the technology is happening, you know, in the, in the cloud format. Like we are, even as, an, as a design firm, for us, all our data, drawings, everything is exist, non-existent. You know, so, and, and, all, and so things are beginning to happen, and this is how it's gonna, you know, these are the factors they are ev eventually trans transcending down in, in a at a facility level. Coming to the patient part, the way these design disruptions are happening is we have we've begun thinking uh, about population health, disease patterns, things that are happening. You know, the first interface is, you know, it's like uh, manage, it starts from lifestyles. How many folks in this room, you know, are wearing some sort of fitness device, like Apple Watch, Fitbit? Can I have a show of hands? A few. And so the, you know, the, uh, it, it is all beginning from the lifestyle management. You know, I have never seen as many running groups or bicycling groups as I have seen in the past few years. Fantastic, but that's how, you know, the, uh, and this is, th these are the game changers. Then the next thing is the first interface, you know, of if I am, if I am in need of a prognosis or diagnostic, the, the levels of interfaces, which earlier, which began from a, you know, clinic, now it is a multi-speciality clinic. We have options of telemedicine, virtual clinic, retail clinic, physician's office. All these things are happening, but again, I still haven't gotten to the human level yet. The next thing is, of course, urgent care. You know, that these, are, these are where the trauma centers are and so on and so forth, and then the acute care, and of course, you know, then we have the long-term care. The point being that all, you know, traditionally how I would, you know, would have access, like I said, we would only have two, two nodal points. If I were to have a low acuity, like, you know, I'm having a stomach ache or a fever, I'll go to a primary patient care, or in, term, in, in an event of a trauma, I would go to an emergency department. It was pretty, pretty simple. Now we have all these nodes and interfaces, but trying to talk about efficiency and the real care is like pretty much, I'm saying that without any prejudice, calling up a cell phone company and talking to a customer care. So, so how does this impact 
the design? How does it impact the facility? How does it impact the, the health system as a whole? Our thought was that, you know, or, or the rationale was that, you know, we, let's talk about arriving at a balance between the experience, the human experience or the patient experience and the business aspect. We've got to require to have a change in our mindsets, a, a very macro level thinking. You know, we, we've had very serious conversations uh, this morning, you know, about, well, several very specific pertinent questions. To me, they, you know, it, uh, like I said, you know, these experiences are kind of transformational. They are very transactional. We've got to look at what is the value that we are eventually adding because when in, in the big picture, and we are already beginning to experience that, that our real estate and healthcare is being affected by the technologies, by the way we interact with each other at this point. It's already begun to happen. Uh, we are seeing more and more uh, outpatients. We are seeing more and more diagnostics. Facilities are becoming more de decentralized. There, it's all about taking healthcare to people's home as opposed to trying to bring the affected person back to the hospital. When I look at patient, of course, you know, person, I'm stating the obvious. This is what Google tells us. I'm confused actually when I look at it with the same word, able to accept and tolerate delays, problems, suffering without becoming annoyed and anxious. <laughs> same word. Pretty confusing. When I look at profit, that, that, that misery leads to my, because profit is again, you know, well, the financial gain, especially the difference between the amount earned and yata 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 with, with buying, operating, or producing something. What exactly are we trying to produce? So in our case, we because we keep, you know, as we, we are trained, well, with, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked, you know, with, or learned with some amazing scholars in India and outside India and as a team, I think we are, we, we are, we are rephrasing our, you know, our responsibility as, as architects or designers with, with like several of you in the room that it's, it's high time that we start talking about responsible design. We've got to think from every stakeholder's perspective, you know, and how we approach it from a, from a patient's perspective, what does profitability, what does, you know, profitability from a patient or, or, or an individual perspective means just being well-being. For, for me, I just want to go to the hospital, I want to be well and, and want to go home. So the whole idea is, you know, for us, for anybody, the profitability, the profitability could be generate value for all stakeholders. And there are, and not only for yourself, and you, you, we've got to be an enabler for the, all the co-creators. The co-creators, for example, if I have a, you know, we, I heard cafeteria in the morning, I heard, you know, of course, you know, uh, couldn't stop laughing about that counseling room, or, you know, we've had digital libraries, even taxi service. These are co it's a complete ecosystem that gets created when we are creating a facility. So the point is, we've got to imbibe a phil philosophy where we, are, we become an enabler for all the co-creators. And of course, you know, the individual is just a part of a larger whole in, in this context. Be it a health, so in a nutshell, with the way things are happening, you know, right, when we, we talked about, you know, having uh, co-caregivers, in our mind, or we're talking about sustainability, or in our mind, the family's engagement in the delivery of healthcare is natural, and in India, it comes naturally to us. You know, it's, it, as opposed to, you know, well, well, I wouldn't be opposed that in the West, it's, that's not the case. It's pretty much the same, you know, having a family member or having a loved one near to you and, and become a part of that care delivery, you know, it's, it, it, it definitely, you know, we have a lot of data statistics, we have scientific data even within our firm that, that proves that they, it leads to faster healing. So the point is this, for, for this for the, in this nested system, we are talking about having these instruments or framework wh where, where the transformation is happening at a very individual entity, goes back to the pa patient experience, convenience, faster healing, it happens at a community level, when we are talking about designing for a community, and of course, a part of a greater ecosystem. And we, with, with all, you know, I'm gonna come, whatever I'm talking about, we'll actually show you on a case study, which we are actually apply, working on in Delhi, and we have taken consent from the owners to be able to talk about it, where we looked at, uh, you know, the, the, the facilities coming up in Delhi, we looked at the five metro stations in a radius of, let's say, like I think it was five kilometers or something like that um, around the site. And the interaction of, of, of the public 
from that metro station, from that rickshawala, ambulance, we looked at the timings and we engaged with the stakeholders, with the malls, hotels in the neighborhood because we realized when we are coming up, when, we, when the owner builds a 1,200 bed hospital there, it will have an impact on the entire ecosystem. So just being aware from that perspective, that's to, what, to us is what responsible design is about. From again, a patient's perspective or from a designer's perspective, when we talk about having a patient-centric design, our whole thought is to improve the building performance and human experience, develop an integrative, uh, a very rigorous integrative process where, where we are pretty much thinking about all the stakeholders, you know, be it clinicians, uh, nurses, paramedics, and so on and so forth. And it's all research-based. We talked about evidence-based design. You know, we stole the term from, you know, some of the doctors in the room from the evidence-based medicine. But yeah, access to, we have convincing data where, when, when there's a, when there is faster healing, you know, the hospital stays uh, reduced. And that obviously, you know, this, and, and in India, we have enough, you know, it's, we, we don't treat patients to make money. We treat patients so that they get home because there's, so that we can treat the next one. You know, we have, and I'll get to the business aspect where we are actually, even while designing on a facility, we have actually started from the top line of that, what that hospital gets and did some reverse engineering to arrive at the program of what is required to, what do we need to design for in that particular demographic? And I'll show you in the case study. So the, to, to us, it's actually about just realizing the design for excellence, quality, and beauty in all aspects. This is what I meant when we talked about having that ecosystem. So we are a user. The user could be patient. It could be, or, you know, the family member, staff, you know, guys working in the hospital, the community that we are engaging with, co-creators, of course, you know, we have investors. So there's a, there's a not, for, there's a for-profit model. There's a not for-profit model. The whole idea is some that we need the, the whole engine has to operate. You know, when we sit in our, you know, we, we're talking about, well, Rajesh mentioned in the morning about this, uh, hospital in Singapore. Well, you know, the, another example that I can't stop thinking about is Jurong hospital in Singapore. Um, it's a government hospital for those of you who ever get a chance to visit that facility. It, to us, the way they treat, um, you know, in, you know, they had, they have like, it's a very interesting, uh, decontamination area outside the hospital when, you know, they have a complete, uh, uh, concourse where in case of a public endemic, how they, they'll have these showers, you know, to decontaminate in, in time of a mass crisis before people enter the hospital. And it's a government hospital, the, the, the way the circulation finishes and so on and so forth. But again, the budgets are very different. We happen to be working on a government hospital mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, 1,200 bed, where the budget is a billion US dollars versus we are doing a similar size hospital in India for a very different kind of budget, you know. And so not to say one versus the other, but I think uh, we, as, as responsible professionals, we also got to look at, change our thinking and educate the owners or all the stakeholders that it's not at all times about reducing the upfront cost, but it's to look at the overall uh, value in the, in the life cycle of the project. And of course, we cannot stop talking about, somebody mentioned sustainability. Uh, we think it should be a basic, non-negotiable, that you know, and, and looking at Again, going to this facility, when we began, you know, brainstorming what exactly is our mission, we realized the biggest pain point in Delhi right now is the air quality. So our mission was to design a facility that brings the cleanest air in Delhi. So, you know, th that's where we think that we are adding value or profit, if you will, uh, to the whole ecosystem. Well, just something that I really like looking at the image that it's not just about what it looks and feels, but design is to us is about how it works, and especially in a, in a, in a hospital context. So when we talked about, you know, full integration, now again from the, I'm going to spend the next few minutes in the brick and mortar and the transactional portion of, you know, what we do. This is traditionally how we do a typical design. Somebody, the owner gives us a budget, uh, be it for profit, not for profit, somebody gives us a space program, not the functional program, what Martin pointed out. Uh, so, and we, you know, that's been, it's a, the traditional good old inefficient process that we've been using. You do the design, schematic design, submit it for approval, and then the regulations change, you go back to the grind, drawing board, do working drawings, hire a PMC, hire all the construction trades, and do the ribbon cutting. That's what we traditionally have been doing, including ourselves. 
the integrative process, how, how, how our thinking is changing is we've got to look at all the trade partners throughout the design process. This is where, you know, the key point that he said, the, fun the functionality plays the, the key role. In terms of we've got to, the, the f biggest challenge is let's, you know, how do we define the problem? Definition of the problem, you know, what, what programs do we require? What exactly is the purpose? How do we think out of the box? You know, to, in, in my mind, Jugard is not innovation. I have the book, I re read it a couple of times. To me, it's improvisation of inefficiencies, not being able to think ahead. Innovation is innovation. And then not only innovating, how do we apply, you know, in, in a regional context, of course, execution, and then, and then going back and evaluating for lessons learned because that becomes the ammunition for the next project. You know, and, and, and I think those gentlemen are not here. I think the, the, the fantastic story that I have to tell is here are two people, you know, who are a part of the, the conference attendees today where one of them, uh, for one private health system, we designed the low, lowest cost facility that we did in India. It was in Nasik as a part of the REACH model of one of these health systems. And, 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 this, and, and, and quite the opposite, we designed the presidential suite for another competitive healthcare facility. My context of bringing that up is that both of them saw values in both these demographics, not in terms of just the capital cost, but there were other intangibles because they are serving to two different kinds of market and deliver the same quality of care. That's what value proposition was. So how did it be applied to us? So just in terms of whatever I described, talked about earlier, I'll just share a few thoughts with, you know, um, the facility is, uh, it's, it's Max Health System. Um, so they, you know, it's, it's, it's public information so I can talk about it and I've taken, we've taken consent for them to just to be able to talk about the thought process how we, you know, as designers, as their healthcare strategists, uh, their team, you know, and several stakeholders, and some of you are in the room, Dr. Chandrasekhar, he's not here, he's, you know, he's also on the advisory, uh, and, and I apologize if I'm missing some. So the point is, we, we, we thought that how do we, because like I said, they, they earlier said that our top line is very definitive. You know, it was very interesting. We were never driven by the profitability or how much money the hospital is going to make. They just said it that this is the these are the this is the population we are catering to. These are the disease patterns. It was very clearly defined key drivers of what's affecting Delhi and so on and so forth. That became our ammunition as a starting point. That and what goes into that facility. Parallel to that, we knew that we had a box. You know, of course. Uh, with all FSIs and regulations and so on and so forth. And, and we, we, we said, okay, we have, we have this uh, 1.5, whatever, 1.5, 1.9 million square foot box. What goes in there? And, and, and they said, well, that's a good question. We have never really thought about it to that level of detail because not very many people ask that what, what is it, not only what goes in there, but why does it go in there? Because they already have an existing facility and which is functional, they acquired a small facility and now, now suddenly they, are, they bought this piece of land and do not know what to do with it. So, and, and all they knew was there was a transaction. So anyway, the big first thing was how do we define the problem? That became the most intensive part. The, and we spent like probably more than a couple of months just trying to define the problem. There was no architecture, not a single line drawn and just looking at talking to doctors, talking to their past data uh, the health system made their data available to us just to look at what the, what have been the, uh, it was we looked at post occupancy surveys, we looked at the disease patterns, we looked at you know what was again, and, and it was all about demographics here. And then of course, then we went to the design boards and, and you know trying to f develop a program, uh, starting with you know they did their functional program in, in house, we translated that into a strict program what we normally do, and we are still just trying to define the problem. I'm not, you know, expecting you to read the whole thing, but these are what you see here are just stickies. What we did was we just, you know, drafted a pretty much a 15 month schedule, 15, and, and this is, well, this was, this is time to be uh, stretched over a period of three years, but you know, what we could fit in the, for, in, the, in the foreseeable future, just from a design perspective was what's gonna happen in the next 15 months. We just identified key milestones in the Delhi context, and you know, and, and uh, like I'm talking in terms of approvals, milestones, monsoons, and the process, and then 
here were their disruptors in terms of just process. We talked to their clinicians, oncology groups, and so on and so forth, and we haven't even touched basement, non-basement yet. We're just trying to define the problem and why we are doing it. Then we said, and we, you know, I, I give credit to their <coughs> chief strategy officer, Rohit Kapoor. He, we stole this term from a granular area distribution. We started looking at, okay guys, when we define a problem, let's look at what is non-negotiable. Non-negotiable is, you know, of course, the building bylaws, which like I said, there's a reason I said the, you know, I'm the guy standing between yesterday and the national building code, which has said that no hospitals in India beyond 45 meters. So. I hope I'm not the first guy who broke that news there. So, uh, you know, the non-negotiable was the building bylaws, of course, the requirements by, you know, all the accreditations and so on and so forth. The negotiable was where we began looking at things because one of the things, you know, we discovered was the hospital functional is one aspect. How do we park, find places to park 3,000 cars that are going to be wheeled in and out of that facility? And that was the context when, why we began looking at the metro rails, the U-turns, what happens, in, because that site is surrounded by a, a hotel, a, a mall, another hospital, some land encroachments, and, and in, a f in, in not more than 60 feet of road ahead of the facility. Our first reaction was, the guy is going to get conked off, you know, before he even goes there. Uh, so just moving along, I'm going to just, you know, uh, so we looked at, our thought was, you know, let's look at things before optimization and uh, after optimization. I'm, I'm just going to go into quick, you know, a couple of things which I might be of some interest to you. You see this orange? This was all parking. This was a healthcare space. And these are all statutory re requirements, not being an overkill. So our design team question, are we designing a hospital or are we designing a parking garage and, and then residual space goes for healthcare? But what we did was let's look at, like I said, you know, I'm not going to get into details, optimizing space. Because to us, this is where we were adding to the profitability. Similarly, we looked at all the individual areas. I apologize for these, but this is clinical, public areas, circulation, and engineering areas, parking. We looked at trying to cut corners. Be aware, not compromising or reducing. We didn't go to the budgets yet. We didn't go to the profits yet. We were just looking at optimizing spaces. Similarly, then we, you know, specifications. We talked about, you know, quota stone, green marble, Italian marble. That forms just a co component, not more than 3% of the project cost. And so, so, like I said, you know, somebody mentioned in the morning, rightly so, where you save money or, you know, optimize it, your program. You know, the first thing. Again, you know, moving along, uh, then we looked at, of course, cost per bed. I'm running a little bit out of time, but if anyone is interested, I'll be more than happy to go. This is just data, just data, data. And, and not, and we looked at, you know, we, we, someone mentioned about inboards, outboards, toilets. I can go on and on for the whole day about the inboards and outboard toilets, but, but we looked at those kind of things. And sometimes it was, like I said, optimization on the overall built up area without compromising on the structure and or the beds. Uh, we looked at ICU bays and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into details. And then of course, Delhi or India, teaches you to master the art of ambiguity. Like I said, till yesterday, this hospital was 80 meters, and yesterday, we knew it's gonna be like 45 meters. <laughs> so, and, and we are re getting ready for approvals. So I'm not going to, I think I have some information how we translated into, you know, lowering the cost of operations in sustainability, you know, facade, and it's not rocket science. In India, it's very easy. We brought simple concepts of physics, like desert coolers, and things like that as a part of our landscape. Like, like we had these fountains, we we're going to have these fountains, just simple water bodies, mystifiers here. We studied and, you know, we have, the, we've, there are these tools available for anybody who's interested, like parametric modeling and so on and so forth. In Delhi, we get, well, in this area, we got wind from southwest side. So the whole idea is that when the wind blows here, it's going to pass through those mists and at least try and reduce the temperature here uh, at the concourse. This is north, uh, well, northwest, uh, northwest. Glass only on north, we won't have any glass, but gla yeah, glass only on north side, no glass on west, and you know, this is how we looked at materiality, or lowering the cost, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is, you know, I, I think, I, yeah, this, this is what I was talking about in terms of the mystifiers. And this is what it looks like, and our goal is to reduce the PUI, uh, the energy unit index, the prep energy un unit index by 50%, and it's possible. Very much possible. We are very fortunate, you know, credit goes to this firm, you know, Aeon engineers who worked with us 
And like I said, we were just looking at numbers at this point from without even going inside the facility. So just to wrap up, I think going, uh, like I said, it's all about an functioning as enablers and facilitating that thinking for the future. That's to us, you know, what responsible design is all about. And I'm just going to wrap up. I'm out of time. But just this is quick video which will su summarize pretty much everything that we have. It's just about one minute, 30 seconds, and it'll just summarize, yeah. It's no longer about just creating spaces to treat sick people. It's about designing for well-being. It's about bringing value and thought leadership by integrating deep dive research, lean and integrated delivery, and big picture thinking. Rigorous research is underway. Do patients requiring healthcare services want to be treated like patients or consumers? Are physicians and patients ready for telemedicine? What are the key design features of a fully adaptable facility regardless of passing trends? Our research group Cadre found the answers to these questions through the Clinic 20XX research study. We're looking at the way we deliver projects. At Akron Children's Hospital, together as a collaborative team, we saved $40 million by using lean and IPD processes. We're also tracking operational performance to see what improvements they are experiencing. Sherry Valentine's operational excellence at Akron Children's said they've never had these conversations before regarding design and construction. They've discussed care model efficiencies, but never applied this to the built environment. We're also thinking big picture on how our clients deliver health. We're making an impact in the health of our communities in ways that go beyond traditional hospital design. We are architects, urban planners, clinicians, and health strategists focused on operations, finance, research, planning, and design. This is where we bring the most value to our clients and their communities. For example, at Metro Health in Cleveland, Ohio, we are working with our client to transform their system to focus on population health. The result is a campus transformation that embraces the community, encourages economic development, and fosters healthy lifestyles. We're all living longer now, and we want to live well. And we know design can make a significant impact on health and well-being. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience and your attention. Thank you.